Good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope y'all are doing well. The title of this Bible study today is called Contention in the Church. What should I do about it? What should I do? Well, if you hang with me to the end of this Bible study, I'm going to give you some practical advice about what you can do. If you find yourself in a situation where you don't go to church because of contention, or you're in a church and there's all kinds of contention going on and you feel like, you know, that your growth with God is being interrupted. It's being um, constrained because of the contentions that are going on at your church or lack thereof. You know, you're not going to church at all because uh, you see all of the heresies that are being uh, taught in what they call a church where the Holy Spirit isn't within a thousand miles of those buildings that call themselves churches. I just saw an article today about uh, T.D. Jake suing uh, a, another minister called, uh, his name is is uh, Gino Jennings. He's an African-American like T.D. Jakes, and he was exposing T.D. Jakes for his heresy preaching. T.D. Jakes is a prosperity preacher. He is a preacher that... Um, you know, has, is very compromising, let's put it that way, okay? And he's very wealthy, giving donations to his ministry. He's not the only one. Joel Osteen is another heretic. Andy Stanley is another heretic. Um, I saw there was an article from Now the End Begins the other day. Uh, and check this out. This was crazy during the Super Bowl. Um, Sanctuary City in Denver... Um, this is, no, this is not the, I thought it was a church in Denver. Let's see. Sorry. Um, let me grab this one for you really quick because, oh yeah, it's called Crossroad Church. Crossroads Church in Cincinnati, Ohio puts on shameful and worldly display with their Super Bowl of preaching last day's Laodicean nightmare. And they had people coming out on a stage and there was a person with artificial grass on the stage where he was holding a Bible like a football. And one of these folks comes up and punts the Bible into the crowd like a football. Talk about disrespect of the word of God. I mean, this is something you would see from children, but from a grown up adults. Um, let me read a passage of scripture to you in Timothy. Okay. Uh, I want to take a temperature reading for where we are. I want to talk about the church a little bit. And then I want you to come to your conclusions when I'm done with this Bible study. If some of you start to chime in with me, I'll be, I'll keep, be keeping an eye out for your comments. Uh, it's no problem for me to collaborate with you on here. This is what Bible studies are all about. We're all about studying the Word of God. Now, here we go. Second Timothy chapter 3. Verses 1 through 13. Want a temperature reading of the church? Do you want a temperature reading of where we are? Paul tells Timothy, and he gives Timothy a bird's eye view of the future. Timothy was a, um, he was a, a student of St. Paul. And, and, he, and Paul was teaching him. Paul was a mentor. He was the apostle for our New Testament church which he still is, by the way, today. We're always in the New Testament reading about Paul's teaching, lifting that hood up under, under, an in, under, the, under a car and seeing the engine and seeing how the, how the engine works. And that's, that's what we do when we hammer out doctrine in the, in the age of grace. Know this also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. And hey, you would expect that from the world, right? But you want to know something? It's in the church. This list is absolutely in the church also. Do we really, is it really a church? That's the big question. Is it, are these buildings that have a sign that say church of this or church of that? Do they really represent Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen? Ask yourself that question when I go through this list. In verse 3, they're without natural affection, which means 
they're lusting after strange flesh. In other words, LGBT, the ABC alphabet group. All right. You know who I'm talking about? Truth breakers, false accusers. Um, I know a lot of people that go to church that are false accusers. How about you? They're not interested in studying scripture. They're not interested in Bible studies. They're not interested in unity. But they are interested in, in false accusations. Incontinent. They're fierce. Despisers of those that are good. I'm talking about people that are walking into a building called a church. They're traitors. They're heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Paul is telling Timothy, saying, hey, you see this kind of conduct going on in a church? Now, look, we're going to see that in the world. And believe me, this is a description of the world that we live in also. But, but, what does he say in verse 5? It's a clue. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So, he is listing people that are going into churches. And he's listing all of their ungodly conduct right here. Let me give you that passage of scripture again. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. You know, you start getting into d discussions about God's power with the Holy Spirit in living inside, and they deny that. They say that healings are not for today. They'll say that the gift of speaking in another language is not for today. Any of those, any of those uh, powers and the gifts that Paul describes, what follows believers, they deny that power. They're more interested in being lovers of them on their own selves, covetous, boasters. They're proud and blasphemers, truce breakers, false accusers, etc. Okay? This is what, uh, what I'm doing is I'm telling you what Paul is peeling back the truth about what's going on in the church today, who ministries and lots of organizations who are calling themselves a church. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, when I tell you they're frauds, they're hacks. They're not really the church of Jesus Christ at all. But Paul peels it back and he shows you how corrupted they actually are. Now, pay close attention to this because it gets a little more interesting, okay? In verse 6, it says, For of this sort they are they which creep into the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. You know, I've been going to church off and on for many years, okay? And I've fallen into that category where a lot of you are at right now, where it's like, I've given up, man. I'm not going to church. I'm, I'm tired of this. I don't want to be a part of all that garbage they got going on down there. I'll just sit at home and my Bible will sit over here, right? And I'm going to read my Bible. <laughs> but your Bible continues to sit there and collect dust because you're not being edified. You're not around other believers where you walk away feeling fulfilled because, you know, you have a bunch of other Christians who are thinking like you that get edified and you have the Holy Spirit with you. Um, but, you know, the idea that Satan wants to, what he is, his objective is, is to get all of us. Um, isolated. That's the word I want to use. Isolated. He wants everybody isolated and he doesn't like it when you're online collaborating with other Christians. He really doesn't like that at all. But he would rather he would rather live with that than he would you actually going to a, 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 um, a church filled with Holy Spirit filled Christians where they're actually following the Lord. What we call in 2024 the Philadelphia Church, the, the Church of Brotherly Love. He doesn't want you collaborating with anybody in person. Far be it from you to do that. He doesn't want you doing it online either, believe me. Um, but he definitely, he, you know, he will get angry if you have a group of Christians that you're with that all love the Lord and you're of one accord. That's a danger to his kingdom. And he doesn't want that, okay? But I'm listing out for you some some details that Paul tells Timothy what our generation is looking like right now. And 
Do you notice that he mentions these silly women in here in verse uh, verse number six? He says they um, they are they which creep into ha into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins and led away with diverse lusts. Those are people that sit in church. Now I'm not just picking on women only. Okay, I just mentioned T.D. Jakes. I mentioned Joel Osteen. These heretics that are behind the pulpit preaching heresies, but then you got another group of folks sitting in the pews who have been let us, they've been, they've been lured away. They've been lured away by these heretics, okay, that are not preaching the word of God or they're misquoting scripture and things like that. And these silly women, what they do is they go into church and some of them are pretty old, by the way, okay? They got really nothing going on in their life. They're not happy people. The only, the only um, fulfillment, and this is very sad, the only fulfillment that they can find in their miserable lives is to create dissension, create problems, create, um, hey, this is not fair because this was mine and, and, and somebody took it, or that's my favorite seat in the church, or that person didn't like my chicken that I made, and they, I heard them complain about my chicken, or something like that, or, or they find problems with people that have the Holy Spirit that are motivated to help people find Jesus, right? Oh my goodness, I'm, gonna, I'm going to attack that person. You know, I have had, um, this is really an interesting situation that I've had in Idaho County. You know, some years ago, and I'm going to keep going with these scriptures, so tune in. What I'm doing right now is I'm peeling back the corruption of the church, all right? And why people don't want to go to church and why they're isolated right where Satan wants you to be, sitting in your house, um, so that you're not edified, so that you're not encouraged, so that you're not fed the Word of God. You're going to go find something on YouTube, all right? Or you're going to find something on Facebook or TikTok or wherever you go. Um, and believe me, Satan doesn't want you out making a difference for, for Jesus Christ, okay? I've been like that Elijah guy for a long time, where... You know, the last two folks that were really following the Lord closely that I could always rely on for the most part was my parents. And they're gone. So I've taken the mantle and I've decided to carry on what they were doing for God. And they're not around right now for, for me, okay? So that's all right. That's a part of life. We all die someday. If we live long enough or we get sick, something happens and we, we expire. We live in a very unique generation now where we're, we're going to see the rapture of the church. I know that people get tired of hearing that. And I've actually had people mock, mock and laugh at, at that prospect. Or they get, it, what it is, is they're really irritated about that prospect because, you know, they love their life. They're like what I'm reading here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. They love their misery too much. They don't want Jesus to come. Even in the church, even people who claim to believe in Jesus. But I have been like that. Elijah guy out in the desert for a long time and I'm I'm in that group I've been in that group with a lot of you folks where it's just too frustrating to go to church I'm gonna sit and do it at home and I'm gonna uh, you know what I do though I'm not too shy in front of a camera so I will you know I'll go on social media and I'll I'll create these Bible studies and I talk about politics from time to time and I talk about what's happening in the world of politics or just some craziness or whatever, you know, whatever God leads me to talk about, but it's mostly scripture because scripture is not silent about what we're seeing today. But here's something that's interesting that's happened in my community recently. Um, there's been, there was a Baptist church. It's still around um, many years ago that my mom and dad were attending for a while and it had that spirit of religion in it. And I mean, it was bad. Okay. And I would hear a few of the deacons, and, or I'm sorry, the elders, I should say the elders, moan and complain that we really need to get this thing going. You know, we need to get recruit people and get them in here and, and help them. You know, they never really talked about finding Jesus, but they would just say, we got we to gotta get some kind of revival going on, okay? I don't know what the version of the revival is supposed to be about. My version of a revival is to help people find Jesus, okay? And then... What happens after that is God will work on that person as an individual through the power of the Holy Spirit to help them grow. Um, and that's where I find myself working in God's vineyard right now, doing some, doing those types of things. 
But those those elders of that time, and nothing ever happened. I mean, my mom and dad got frustrated with that church at times because they constrained the Holy Spirit a lot in there. And you would get one pastor that would come in and he would last maybe a year or maybe two years at the most. I don't know that I remember a pastor ever long and la- lasting longer than two years in that church. And then they would get frustrated and leave because there was troublemakers in the pews all the time, complaining, 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 complaining. And they were, they had like positions in the church that were um, treasury secretary or, or moderator of a business meeting or, or whatever. And the meetings were so boring and dry when you tried to sit through it, it was like, I need some coffee to get through this, guys. This is pretty boring, what we're talking about here. And you just couldn't wait to get out of there. <laughs> Nothing exciting about it at all. And and these these folks that had been in these positions for some years, they were perfectly happy with where they were, not being in a leadership position to accept any type of responsibility at all, but to use their position, their very small position, by the way, to manipulate the pastor, to manipulate his wife, or to manipulate a family who actually walked through the door with his children and his, and his wife, who was maybe looking for Jesus. And then these folks would say something offensive and they would get angry and leave. So read, do I need to read second Timothy chapter three again? Well, Paul tells us exactly who they are. Okay. And Hey, if there's anybody, and I'm sure there will be eventually, Because some of these folks who were the troublemakers at my church that left, what we did, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to be really honest with you. And this is a rarity in 2024 in this generation, in this season, I should say. But it's a rarity, but God's doing something in our church. We'll see what happens in the future, okay? I'm not going to predict the future with it. But there's this giant chess board out there, right? And there's a whole bunch of chess pieces on the board, and they're churches, And Satan's on this side and God's people are on this side over here. Okay. And what we, what we went and did through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I should say, is we removed one of Satan's chess pieces off of the board. Okay. And he's not happy about that. He's not happy at all. I'm now a deacon at this church and we have, uh, we have a new group of folks here that are in the church that fear God that fear the Lord. And there might be some of these former folks that are watching this video right now, but you don't want to know why? Because I'm hashtagging Idaho County. I'm going to hashtag Kuski, Idaho. I'm going to hashtag Stites. I'm going to hashtag Lewiston. I'm going to hashtag Orfino. I'm going to hashtag Harvester. Yes, I know these locations. Okay. And I'm talking to you right now. I'm not talking to this other group that I got out here, blood, bought and born again. And some of you other folks that I love a lot, um, I'm talking to the local folks in, in here for a moment. Do you want to know something? You all have been con- creating a lot of contention for you for years and your time is up. At least in our church, it's up. There's no more contention going on. You're going to have to find you're going to have to find another place, another building that calls himself a church. And you're going to have to take all of your contention and your demonic activity and go over there. Because we're done with you, all right? You're not coming back to our church. You're done. You should be ashamed of yourselves for manipulating a senior elder whose health is rapidly declining and his wife is bedridden, ready to die, manipulating that poor elder because he is in a compromised position. He's not the strong man that he used to be, and he doesn't have the discernment that he used to have. But you all taken, you all have taken him and manipulated him to take the attention away from your bad conduct and to make him somehow a victim uh, of this new movement that's going on in the church, which by the way, he has never been expelled or so he's never been welcome or anything like that. Um, And they've manipulated this poor guy and they should be ashamed of themselves, by the way, for this, this is terrible what they've done, but believe me guys, when anybody is being led by Satan, they don't have a conscience. It's been seared with a hot iron. They're not interested in evangelism. They're not interested in in scripture. They're not interested in prophetic things. Um, They're perfectly happy if you have some puppet up there on a stage giving a dry, boring sermon that doesn't do no good for nobody. As long as they can sit in the pew and manipulate and control, they're happy, okay? 
That's over with in our church, by the way. We have, like I said, we have an amazing group of folks. Now, this is a rarity, ladies and gentlemen, but I have a feeling, have a feeling that this is not the only place where God is working right now. Um, and I have to bring this up I, I, because I have a point and a place that I'm going with this, okay? And it's good to see some of you on. Thank you very much for joining me. God bless you too, Lorna, and uh, good to see you, Mitt. Thank you, brother, and Todd. I see Todd's here and Sherry. And um, God bless you, lady. Como esta? Uh, buenas tardes. <laughs> so, yes, we have some different folks on today. Thank you very much for coming on. This is a Bible study. I'm in certain parts of, of Scripture that talk about bad conduct and strife. And what are we going to do about it? Are we... Are, are you just going to, are you going to take your ball and go home? Are you going to sit around and are you going to do nothing? Are you just going to sit around and wait for the rapture or wait for God to do what he's going to do? Or are you content being on the sidelines and not doing anything for God? If you really love God, if you really love Jesus, you probably are not content, but you don't know what to do. Okay. I'm going to give you some advice on what I think you should do. This is just coming from me personally. It doesn't mean that wherever you are and wherever you live, that this could happen in, in the local area where you're going, but it did happen in our area. And these troublemakers are out. And I will say furthermore, we don't know who's gonna come through the door and we don't know who's gonna go out the door, but they, we, I'll guarantee you guys one thing, before everything is said and done in our area, these folks in this community are gonna know that we're here. And that's not a, a bad statement to make. What that means, is there's going to be a lot of advertising in our church and we are going to focus on being a blessing to the community, a blessing uh, to the courthouses who need to send their, um, their, their people who need to dry out of alcohol or drugs or grieving families who have lost loved ones. Um, we're going to get involved a little bit probably in the prison ministry. We're going to have programs with Bible studies. We're going to have a puppet show for the kids. We're going to have fishing clubs, ATV clubs. We're going to do what all of these, these guys and gals like to do in Idaho out here. We're going to have programs for that stuff. Now, we may not be able to get all that done overnight, but that's our goal. And our goal is to be a blessing to the community. So when these other troublemakers start saying bad things about us, and hey, troublemakers, um, guess what? I have a microphone, okay? So when you start spreading your gossip and you start saying things that are not true, a word of warning, I have a microphone and I have an audience in this community and I will call you out on your bad conduct. I may not mention your name, but I will call you out on your conduct, okay? And believe me, I'm quite good at it. I've been doing it for a long time. I'm not a troublemaker, but I call out bad conduct and I'm good at it. Maybe that's a gift, maybe not, I don't know. But that's what I do. That's, <laughs> I've been struggling with the world, the flesh and the devil my whole life, guys. Let me continue in scripture though, okay? Are, are you all with me? Everybody okay? Let's continue with what Paul says about these folks. He, uh, uh, he says here in verse eight, he reminds, he reminds us what type of people that we're dealing with in 2024 today in the church, the, the troublemakers. You want to know who they are? He compares them to, in verse 8, the Jannies and Jambres who withstood Moses in the desert out in um, Saudi Arabia many years ago when God led his people out of Egypt. And they were out in the desert. And there was a group of folks. And you want to know what's interesting about those group of folks? The troublemakers out in the desert? They were under influence of those Egyptian gods for 400 years. And they were living in a society where that crappy religion of Egypt was being pushed in their face all the time. So they had a problem. And it wasn't a problem that they could um, be cured of overnight. But they, they, they apparently were never able to overcome that, even when they saw all of the miracles that God performed for them out in, in Egypt and all of those plagues hit. You think if God parted the Red Sea for you and you walked across on dry land, y'all think that maybe um, you should get in line 
with God's program, I think I would. But but uh, Paul reminds us here, he says, the Jannies and Jabberies who withstood Moses, so do all these who resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds and reprobates concerning the faith. You know who a reprobate is, guys and gals? A reprobate is an LGBTQ. I told you about Andy Stanley and a lot of other ones. He's just a guy that they push in, in everybody's face in media, but you want to know there's many of them. And guess what else is out there too, guys? Satanic um, churches, satanic, whatever you want to call them. They're out there. In fact, um, where is it? Let me find it really fast. This art, one of these articles here from Now the End Begins. What Satanism, I'm going to send you this in the, um, if you guys want to check out this podcast, uh, I'm going to put this in comments right now, okay? It was very good. I started listening to it last night. I didn't get through the whole thing. But you would be surprised what Satanism actually looks like in 2024. Y'all be shocked, okay? But you need to know. You need to be aware. I'm not telling you to be experts in evil. I'm just telling you to be aware of the deceptions, okay? So you can take the appropriate steps when you see it. Okay. Let me keep going. I'm going to go back over here to Timothy. Um, in verse 9, so they, they, they withstood Moses, okay? So you have these, these people who fear God in the church today who are a type of representation of Moses, where they fear God, they want to, they want to follow the Lord's ways and, and his Ten Commandments and all that. And then you have this other group of folks that are resisting that. Okay, and they've been given knowledge of God, by the way, too. That's what what's really terrible about it. They never had a born again experience. They've never had a born again experience, but they know about the ways of God, which is there's a warning for that in Scripture, too. I should probably pull that up. Let me give you this. Because I have a feeling some of them are listening to this right now. And you might as well get the, the full package. <laughs> okay, it's in um Second Peter chapter two. And let me give you King James, okay? Let me give you King James on this one. One moment. Let me pull it up. I'm almost there. Um, listen to what Peter says here in verse 18, okay? Second Peter chapter two, verse 18. He's talking about folks that they know about God, okay? But never had a born again experience. And I want y'all to understand this is very important to make a distinction between the two because there are folks out there in the Christian community who believe that these people were saved and then they were unsaved by some weird situation that they got unsaved. But when you have a born again experience, you don't get unborn again. And Nicodemus asked Jesus, he says, how do I go back into my mother's womb and get born again? And Jesus said, it's the same thing, but in the spirit, when you're born again, you don't go back into your mother's womb and get born again. And it's the same in the spirit. When you get born again in the spirit, you don't go back. Okay. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and you'll never throw him away. You'll never tell him to go away. You might have moments in your life where things happen, but you'll you'll never deny God when he's living in here and you've been born again. But this is a group of folks here that have heard the knowledge of the truth of God, yet they never made a real decision for God. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought in bondage, in bondage of sin. For it, for it, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord 
and the, and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter is worse than them from the beginning, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than they have known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. What was the holy commandment that was delivered to them? The holy commandment that was delivered to them was to repent and believe what Jesus did for you on the cross. Born again experience requires repentance, ladies and gentlemen, admitting that you're a sinner, that you need a savior, that you need Jesus, that he died and rose again for you according to the scriptures. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Um, but the, the key word in this passage is knowing. But knowing is one thing and acting on it is something else, okay? When you know what the right thing is to do, but you don't act on it, in other words, I need to make a decision for Jesus and get born again, then you act on the knowledge, okay? And those are a different group of folks. But these folks were given the truth and they knew about it, but they didn't make that decision for God. Because as uh, Paul told Timothy, these were silly women or even silly men that were just... Um, let me go back and read it again for you. Okay, in 2 Timothy um, 3, chapter 3, verses um, okay, uh, 6. For they of this sort are they which creep into the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Diverse lust means di different kinds of lust. We're not talking about sexual things all the time here. And Paul is saying diverse lust. You can lust in gossip. You can lust in food. You can lust in, in covetousness. Examples. Um, you can lust in, I've got to have it my way. Whether it's right or wrong, it's got to be my way. And if it's not, I'm going to get angry about it. And I'm going to let everybody know I'm angry about it because I'm going to raise my voice and I'm going to be angry. And I'm going to let all those Christians know they're not going to mess with me. Blah, 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 blah. How important are you all of a sudden that you're going to create a bunch of division in the church? Maybe somebody that's never been saved, somebody that's coming to church looking for God, and you're going to run them off with your big mouth. It's better that you're out the door, miss or mister, whoever you are. Okay. Um, now look at... Look at uh, Look at what Paul says to the to the born again Christians. He says in verse ten, "But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, which means love and patience." You know, man, I'll tell you what: as a Christian today, you got to have the patience of Job for some people. Look at what's happening in our country. You have to have the patience of Job to see what the Democrats have done to our border and opening it up. And God bless those people in Texas, man that have put up the wall, you know, and put the razor wire up and have done things to stop that immigration. It's ruining our country. I could get into some prophetic stuff about that, but I'm not here for that tonight, okay? But we, as Christians, we should be leading the example of having patience, long-suffering faith, you know? Because worldly people that are conservative, worldly people that love Donald Trump, for an example, they're not so patient and they're not so long suffering and they fly off. You know, some of these folks that I'm telling you about that left our church, well, they're Trump people. And, you know, they have signs on their fence in front of their yard that says F Joe Biden and a bunch of other things. That, that's not, that's really good, right? As a Christian, having that on your, on your fence, F Joe Biden, right? That's real nice. Look, give place to wrath. For vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. What we do, what we do to combat these, this evil, wicked, antichrist garbage that's being thrown in our face, is we shine a light on the gospel, what saves men's souls and women's souls. That's how we combat it. And Satan will get absolutely enraged when you start doing that. You want to get even with, with the Democrats, besides voting in November? I don't know what's going <laughs> to We have corrupt elections anyway, but... You, you want to make them mad? You start opening up Bible verses, ladies and gentlemen. That's going to get them angry because they don't like absolutes. I got news for you Democrats and liberals out there. and You um, Yuval Noah Harari and Klaus Schwab and some of you other people up there, Justin Trudeau in Canada. 
you don't like the absolutes of Scripture, right? Well, you're going to get the Antichrist someday, and you might laugh at that prospect. But he is going to make you do things that you don't want to do. You're going to give your power over to him in one hour because of a catastrophe that's coming. And I, I have an idea about what that cat catastrophe is, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. First, it's going to be partially, it'll be the rapture of the church. After the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, ladies and gentlemen, you can absolutely believe there will be a void of leadership like the world has never known when we are taken out of the way. Right now, the Holy Spirit is holding that man back. But as soon as this, we are taken out of the way, there's going to be nations that give the, their, their power over to the Antichrist. And then these people that hate our message, they're going to go, oh, we love this guy. He thinks like we do. Yeah, he's, he's got it going on. Let's give him, let's give him the authority. We can trust him. And there's a noose that's being put around their necks, right? And they have no idea. They have no idea. It says in Proverbs that there's a trap laid out for everybody to see. And only the smart birds don't get caught in the trap, okay? But the stupid birds get caught. And these people that hate God and hate Scripture, they're the stupid birds. And there's a trap laid out for them. And they're going to get caught in it. And the Antichrist, about three and a half years into this whole thing, after we're gone, the church is gone, He's going to demand worship. He's going to, it's going to be a monetary um, mandate. It's so the monetary economies of the world will be tied into this religious system because how's he going to get people to heal just by saying you have to take my mark or I'm going to kill you, right? That's a nice threat and everything. But how will he really get people to do it besides the threats? He's going to cut you off monetarily. And it's, it doesn't matter if it's Justin Trudeau. It doesn't matter if it's Klaus Schwab. It doesn't matter if it's um, Yuval Noah Harari. It doesn't matter if it's um, uh, Ben Solomon in Saudi Arabia. It doesn't matter if it's going to be scornful people in Israel someday that are going to sign a covenant, a deal with the Antichrist. There's going to be a leaderless nation in Israel someday. Maybe Netanyahu won't be there, but it will be scornful people. The Bible says that in Isaiah that sign a covenant of death and hell. They're all going to be under this man's thumb for a while. And Satan hates these warnings. He doesn't like it. And God forbid that I start talking about this in the church. You know, I'm talking about my local church. Now, my local church is just fine right now. But I'm talking about the way it was, okay? The way, the way that it was when, before we got the troublemakers out. Bye, troublemakers. I know that you're not happy. I know that you're angry. And you know what? I really don't care one bit that you're angry because guess what? You've been angry for a long time. It doesn't matter who walks through that door. And this, the fact is, is that you didn't have to deal with me before because I was out doing my thing, living in Vancouver. And sometimes I come and visit my parents, but now i got a nice ranch home up here. I'm digging my heels in and you got to deal with me and not just me, but every other God fearing Christian that's going to be coming to our church. You're going to, have to deal with them too. Okay. And it's not a threatening way. What it means is we're going to be a blessing to the community. And I challenge you, what kind of blessing are you going to be to the community? Are you going to be a blessing or are you going to, are you going to just do what, what Paul says here and spread more gossip and more sin? Is that your contrib contribution to God? Okay. So my open challenge for you is what kind of blessing are you going to be to the community? I'd like to know. If you have an answer for that someday, get back to me and we'll have a conversation. And I mean that. I mean that. If you don't have anything to offer the community other than your scorn and your dissension and your anger and your fits of rage and your ungodly conduct, then don't even bother talking to me. But I will be on here a lot. Believe that. All right. Are you all still with me? <laughs> all right. Um, James chapter four, verses one through 10 says this, it gets more interesting. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet it and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. 
adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is the enmity, enmity of God with God? Whereover, therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that Scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know what? Every born-again Bible-believing Christian that I've known is a humble person. Every single one of them, they get angry sometimes, believe me. I've seen them get upset, get angry, but they're humble people. They're humble people. I know. Those are the ones I love being around. And God says he gives grace to the humble. But if you're a proud person and you got a you got a big mouth and all you know how to do is gossip and spread gossip and talk sin and no Bible verses in your mouth or no love for God in your, on your lips, God's resisting you. He, he promises to resist you. It doesn't matter if you're going to do that in church. If you go home, you're not going to have peace in your home. You think you're going to go down to your, your local church and create a bunch of problems, right? With a smile on your face, by the way. I've seen these people do it with a smile on their face, especially when they can get a humble, godly person upset. When they, when they do that, I've seen their reaction and they're, they're smiling. They're happy. They laugh. But guess what? God's following you all the way back to your house. And you think you're going to have peace in your house? Not going to happen. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Never underestimate how important peace in your own personal life is. To have personal peace in your life. God controls that. <laughs> All right? And if you are doing God's will and you're persecuted for it, you can still go home and have peace. Because you know that you're in his will, okay? If somebody's spreading rumors about you or false accusations or lies, and they're drumming up a bunch of garbage... You might get mad for a few minutes and then just brush it off because you know it's not true. It's irritating, of course, when people make up stuff about you that's not true. But all you do is you continue to be a blessing to the community. You continue to be a blessing to people that are around you. And God God is going to give grace to the humble in verse uh, 6. Okay. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Jesus said that to his disciples. But it's also here in... In uh, James chapter 4, same thing. James says that to us. He says, resist, resist the devil. Resist Satanism. Hey, you Satanists out there, resist that stuff. You're going to go to hell in a handbasket doing that. All right? Your satanic community is... I saw this uh, congressman in Arizona giving a, a place for the satanic community on one... I think it was in Maricopa County the other day. And he was saying that they were good people and they just mean... They just mean, um, uh, they just, they don't mean ill will to anybody. They just want fairness and blah, 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 blah. Not knowing that their leader is a liar. That fallen angel is a satanic liar. It's all about the violence. And I told this story one time before, folks, and it's true. There was a very prominent satanic uh, leader that was dying. I want to say it was about 10 to 12 years ago. And when he was on his deathbed, you know what his last words were? Oh my God, Satan lied to me. He lied. He's a liar. He lied to me. He's a liar. He's a liar. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening to me? And that was it. He was gone. <laughs> Not really funny, but I mean, you know, you 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 satanic people that follow the 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 satanic church, y'all y'all been deceived. Okay, you need to bail. You need to jump ship and get over to the other side and have don't don't just learn about the word of God. Have a born again experience. Because there are folks that learn about God that go to our church that never been born again. They haven't had the born again experience. And when that happens, you get the Holy Spirit living in you. And then you become a new person. You have new motives. You're humble, as it says in verse 6. And God gives grace to the humble. People that are troublemakers are not going to get God's grace. It's very clear here. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. That means to repent. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. 
well, gee, I just don't feel like doing that. I'm not done causing trouble. Well, you want to know something? Honestly, guys, <laughs> let me tell you something, all right? Jesus said this very clearly. He said that nobody is guaranteed tomorrow. You could be here one day and you can be gone tomorrow. You could, it doesn't matter how old you are, by the way, either. You know, I'm just giving you that dose of reality that, that Satan has lied to you about. I'm going to be around for years. I'm going to live like hell because I'm young, right? And then you find out the next day that some of your buddies or whatever were killed in a car crash. Or they overdosed on drugs. Or they got into a fight and they got stabbed by somebody or whatever, you know? Never think for one second that you've got, you've got security in this life. You don't have security in this life. Maybe I'm talking to some troublemakers that have gone to church too. And you've been excommunicated. You've been kicked out. And you're going to, well, I'm just going to go to the church down the street because they got a lot of cars in their parking lot. They must have something going on for God. No, they don't really have anything going on for God that I know about in my area. They just show up and they sit in their favorite seats and they listen to maybe a sermon with some scriptures, but nothing that's really moving. And they have a meal and they go home and, and they wait for next Sunday. And, you know, there's probably contention going on. I don't know what's going on. But the big question is, are these churches a blessing to the community? <laughs> Our plan is, is to be a blessing to the community, okay? And I'm more than willing and, and ready to do those types of things in, in with my group of born-again Bible-believing Christians is to, be, to make a difference, okay? Do you all want to sit at home? And just go on YouTube every day and, and go on, read the bad stuff that's going on on the news. Maybe you believe in God and you're like, well, this is just terrible, but I'm depressed. You know, it's going to get the best of me, etc. But, you know, God protected this, the Hebrews in the land of Goshen in Egypt. You know, when the Passover came, that very final um, plague that killed all the firstborn, God was protecting his people in Goshen. Every single time a, a, a plague hit, Goshen was protected. God will protect you when all of this craziness is happening in the world and he'll put you around born again, Bible believing Christians. And I'm talking about locally. I don't mean just online. Okay. It's a, it's a brand new original <laughs> dynamic that you can actually sit with a group of born again, Bible believing Christians and have fellowship and get into the scriptures and hash out doctrine and study, get edified. And you're not all fighting with each other about things all the time, which is stupid anyway, right? Hey, I'm not right about everything in scripture, but you know what I love to do? I love to get in and I love to dig. And there's been some amazing Christians in my community that I've had Bible studies with that pull out some things that I never saw. And I'm like, wow, I didn't see that before. That's really awesome. And then what happens after we're done? We feel pretty amazing. And we know when we're unified, which Satan absolutely hates, we're a threat to his kingdom in this community. We're a threat to his kingdom. And that's what I challenge everybody to do. I told you before, uh, at the beginning of this Bible study, I told you that I would give you some advice. If you uh, don't have a church to go to, and you feel like you're the Lone Ranger or you don't know what to do, you know. Um, admittedly, this is a rarity that we were able to remove one of Satan's chess pieces off of the board. But we did because this is a Baptist community, a Baptist part of the Baptist organization, you know. Yes, I'm a Baptist now, but I mean, I'm telling you, it's not. Uh, I'm a born again, Bible believing Christian is what I am, really. Okay. I've just decided to make a stand in the community here with some other like-minded Christians. That's what we really are at the end of the day. And I believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, by the way, too. All right. And I'm going to a Baptist church. <laughs> a lot of them Baptists don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but I do, guys. Want to know why? Because I've experienced those gifts and I saw those gifts many times with my parents. And I could tell you stories for days, okay? But I'm not a sensationalist. It has to be according to scripture. Everything has to be according to scripture. 
But here's the advice that I have for you before I let you go. Right? Okay? Here's the advice. If you cannot find a church that you can um, be comfortable with, what I would suggest that you do is go into prayer with God and say, Lord, if you have a church for me, that's great. But if you have a place for me to start or um, join a Bible study that with like-minded people like me that love you, that love your word, that I can get involved in, if it's at a house, you know, the early church, ladies and gentlemen, they all met in their houses in the book of Acts. Before, you know, before it became organized, before uh, Rome tried to come in and, and copyright, take the copyright away from the early church and create the Catholic church, which is all about works. That's a cult, okay? So you have all these imposters that have been around for many, many, many years. But the early church started in houses. And I would suggest for everybody out there, and, and why, you know, let me give you the reason why. You, you really need me to spell it out for you. You need the fellowship. You need the one-on-one -on -one fellowship with other like-minded Christians. And I know that it's a blessing to have those folks online. We have a big, big, large group on Facebook where we all collaborate and stuff like that. But the one-on-one, -on -one, in-person sitting around with Bibles open and singing songs to the Lord, maybe having communion in a house is fine. And ask God that. Say, Lord, if that's what you have for me, just help me get plugged in. And if you all want some more, like if you want to message me on some advice or tips or helping search for that, let me know. I mean, I'd be more than happy to help you. So this is the Bible study today. I hope you, I hope, I know that some of you didn't enjoy it. Because you'll be you'll be those troublemakers, right? But the born again Bible believing Christians absolutely enjoyed this because they're going through it like I am, and they know our days are are numbered, guys and gals. Whether we expire on this earth or the Lord breaks through the skies someday and calls us home, that's literally going to happen. So this was not a Bible prophecy up to date update today. This was about the church. And yes, I do talk about other, other things other than Bible prophecy. I'm going to be continuing in the life of Jacob and his sons, and we're going to watch some some things that his sons do, all right? And, and Joe, I'm sorry, um, Jacob has his favorite. <laughs> Jacob has his favorite. Hey, good. families, don't, don't show favoritism one son over another, one daughter. Try to love them all equally, okay, so they don't hold grudges. Because we're going to read about that in the life of Jacob, and there's some prophetic implications to it, too. So, um, God bless all of you this evening. Thank you very much for joining me. Minette, um, thank you, too. And God bless you, sister. Um, I'll get back to you on that video that you shared with me earlier today uh, about the Geneva Bible and the King James. I know Geneva's been around a long time. King James has been around quite a long time as well, and it's it's good to, to talk about the different interpretations. So um, we were looking at Ephesians chapter 6, and so, yeah, there were some different interpretations there. But we'll, we'll do that on another day. We'll, maybe we'll do it in chat. So God bless all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, share this video. Okay, guys, share it. Share it because it needs to be heard. These messages, although not popular with most of the world, still need to be heard. Okay? They still need to be heard. God bless you. Pray for Donald Trump. He's under persecution, um, losing that money. His, I will tell you one thing that's positive, though. There's going to be some more positive things happen. His true social is going through the roof, and I do believe that he was offered like $10 billion for a sponsorship for true social. So the man is making money still, all right? He's not, he might lose some money here and there. I don't even know that he's going to have to pay any of these lawsuits because they're absolutely ridiculous anyway. And, and these Democrats are running out of options. They're really running. And these theories, by, and I'm sorry, I don't want to rabbit trail too much here, but these theories about Joe Biden being replaced, um, I'm, I would be really surprised at this point if they do it. I think they're stuck with him at this point, okay, because they're running out of time. So they're stuck with Joe Biden. If he wins another four years, then he will be replaced because he's not going to last four years. That's a cold, hard facts. And I'm not a doctor, but I know what dementia looks like, and he will not last another four years if he wins. 
But I have a feeling, I have a feeling that God may reinstall Trump again for another four years for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. We'll talk about that on another day. Thank you very much, guys. I will see you again very soon. God bless. Take care. And the Lord be with you.